Welcome to the Rewards of Work Lessons from the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, this conversation is part of the Economic Opportunities Program ongoing Opportunity in America discussion series, in which we explore the changing landscape of economic opportunity in the United States, the implications for individuals, families, and communities across the country, and ideas for change. We are grateful to Prudential Financial, Walmart, the Cerdna Foundation, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, Bloomberg, and the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth for their support of our Opportunity in America discussion series. Uh, welcome to our regular participants. And if this is your uh, first time joining us, a special welcome to you. Um, we record all of our events and all our previous events can be found on our website at as.pn slash Opportunity in America. Today's discussion is the second event in a set of conversations titled The History and Future of U.S. Labor Law, Conversations to Shape the Future of Work. In this series, we're exploring the history of U.S. labor laws, how these laws affect opportunity and job quality today, and exploring what we need to do to help improve conditions for workers now and into the future. In this second conversation, we'll be discussing the Fair Labor St Standards Act of 1938, which established the federal minimum wage, overtime pay, the standards for work week and prohibited um, child labor. So we have an amazing panel to talk with us about all of this today. Um, and I'm really excited to, to welcome that, welcome them in a, in a minute. Also a quick note, uh, we have a couple of other exciting events coming up on April 19th. Uh, we'll host Sarita Gupta of the Ford Foundation and Erica Smiley of Jobs with Justice uh, to discuss their new book, The Future We Need, Organizing for a Better Democracy in the 21st Century. And on April 27th, we'll have our next event in this series, uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, fulfilling the promise of equal opportunity. So I hope you can join us for those events as well. Um, also, before we begin, begin, just a quick review of our technology. All attendees are muted. Um, hopefully I am no longer muted. Uh, we welcome your questions. Please use the Slido box on the right side of your screen for questions or comments. Um, questions can be submitted and upvoted through the Q&A tab. Um, we also know we have a great audience with lots of experience and perspective on these issues. If you have ideas, examples, resources, um, things to share about today's topic, please share those in the ideas tab, which is also in your Slido box. And lastly, we also um, very much appreciate your feedback. Please, before you leave, there is a, a feedback survey. You'll find it in the polls tab in the Slido box. Um, and we hope you'll let us know what you think. Um, we're thrilled with the participation in today's event. Um, thank you for many of of you who submitted questions in advance. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can in the Q&A uh, session. Uh, so please do uh, keep questions coming. Uh, we also encourage you to tweet about today's event. Our hashtag is talk opportunity. If you have any technical issues, uh, you can uh, message us in the chat or email us at eop.program at aspeninstitute.org. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be shared via email and posted on our website following this event. Um, closed captions are available. Please click the CC button at the bottom of your video screen to activate those if you need them. Okay, uh, and now it is my great pleasure to introduce our opening speaker, um, David Weil. David is um, just an amazing scholar. David is a, a Dean Professor at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. Um, David led the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division during the Obama administration from 2014 to 2017. Um, he's an internationally recognized expert. Many of you may be familiar with his book, The Fissured Workplace, Why Work Became So Bad for So Many and What Can Be Done. Um, he's just an incredible scholar, and uh, I can't think of anybody better to kick off this conversation. So, David, thank you so much for joining us, and let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Maureen, um, for the invitation to participate today and for the patience in figuring out uh, under what guise I would be appearing. <laughs> um, I had hoped to be making this talk as the administrator of the Wage and Hour Division, but I got caught in a 53 to 47 car pileup on the road to Senate confirmation. Um, as tempted as I am to comment on some of the vehicles involved in that accident, I'm going to reserve my remarks on that for some future occasion, but we'll make a few comments at the end about the political economy surrounding workplace policy at this very troubled moment. <clears throat> 
I wanted to open this important session with the same thoughts I would have offered if I was wearing the administrator hat. And what I want to do is make the case why the Fair Labor Standards Act and its robust enforcement is fundamental to providing the kind of treatment and protections workers in the U.S. should demand and expect. And let me start with a little history um, about why the FLSA is such a powerful document in law. Um, when Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal legislation establishing the National Recovery Act was struck down by a conservative majority of the Supreme Court, Francis Perkins, FDR's Secretary of Labor, told him something to the effect, don't worry, I have two bills locked in the lower left-hand drawer of my desk prepared against such an emergency. One of those bills was a public contracts act that set labor standards for goods produced under government contract. It became the walsh Healy Act. The other was a fair labor standards bill that set minimum wages, maximum hours, overtime conditions, and other labor standards for working people in the private sector. And of course, that latter bill became the Fair Labor Standards Act. It's too easy to think about the New Deal era as part of a golden age of progressive enlightenment where anything that was possible uh, happened given the huge Democratic majorities uh, Franklin Roosevelt enjoyed in the Senate and House. In fact, the Fair Labor Standards Act was the last major piece of progressive legislation uh, about the workplace of that era. It faced fierce opposition from the business community and from the powerful bloc of Southern Democrats in Congress. So despite a huge Democratic majority, what FDR signed was radically different from what Perkins had pulled out from her drawer a year earlier. And in particular, it contained, the final bill contained huge exclusions for industries where black workers predominated, agriculture in particular, but also many parts of what we would now call the service economy. As Ira Katz Nelson documents in his terrific book, Fear Itself, that exclusion was explicitly motivated by race. Um, to illustrate that, he quotes Representative Martin Dees, a Texas Democrat and fierce opponent of the FLSA, who stated on the House floor that the proposed law was wrong in that it, quote, what is described for one race must be prescribed for others, and you cannot prescribe the same wages for the black man as for the white man, unquote. So sadly, the exclusion of black workers from the protection of workplace laws was not unique to the FLSA, and it certainly shaped its impact for decades to come. Yet in the end, I want to make the case of the importance of the act at the time of its passing. And I think it still rings true today. When it was first passed, the very first wage and hour administrator, Elmer Andrews, stated, the Fair Labor Standard Act has been a strong floodlight thrown upon the dark places of American industry. The unpleasant things we could not see before and the things we did not wish to see stand revealed. We cannot duck them. No amount of talk about the beauties of rugged individualism will obliterate them. FDR's assessment of the FLSA was a bit more upbeat. He said, I do think that, the, that next to the Social Security Act, it is the most important act that has been passed in the New Deal. So why is the act so foundational? Well, around the time of its passage, a more progressive Supreme Court began to turn away from overturning state and federal workplace laws on the basis of, in the past, protecting liberty of contract of individuals. And instead, the court recognized the inherent disparity in power that was present in the labor market. And in that context, the importance of that term, that so important term, fair labor standards, is all about establishing workplace norms. Those norms don't arise from the voluntary agreement of a specific company or group of companies and aren't reliant on the forces of supply and demand, which we know from recent growing evidence currently, 
are very subject to labor market power that often leads to lower wages. Instead, the power of the FLSA emanates from its creation of wage norms by the force of law. That is fundamental in understanding how it shapes employment decisions that are made and how our labor markets operate. Second, the FLSA is foundational in that the rights and responsibilities it creates represent a bedrock for other workplace rights. One is unlikely to exercise a right to complain about a health and safety risk or discrimination or sexual harassment, or certainly to take the risk of supporting a union if the bedrock principle that's protected by the FLSA of being paid for work itself or protections against long uncompensated hours are daily flouted. Third, the FLSA is foundational in its definitions. Defining employment matters because it sets the boundaries of rights and protections that then shape everything built on that. And despite what is argued by many, including opposition to my nomination, the broad definition of what it means to employ, employ are not outdated concepts. In fact, they are groundbreaking in recognizing the many ways that responsibilities for conditions at work can play out. That is precisely the reason why its definitions of employment, which represent the broadest of any federal legislation for the workplace, have been contested since the act's earliest days. And that is a sign in my view of its resilience, not its obsolescence. The foundational nature of the FLSA is revealed also by how its expansion over time has come to improve conditions for the workers once excluded from its protections. In their brilliant paper, the economists Elora Duranencourt and Claire Montelou show that the 1966 expansion of minimum wage coverage under the FLSA to include agriculture, restaurants, nursing homes, and other services where nearly a third of black workers were employed at that time account for as much as 20% of the large reductions in racial earnings and income gaps of the civil rights era. The impact of the FLSA in a broader scope is, was further illustrated by the expansion of its coverage to 2 million home care workers during the Obama administration. But I also want to point out, even though foundationally the law itself is so important and so fundamental, the FLSA is only as good as its implementation. And this has been a challenge once again from the Act's inception and the creation of the Wage and Hour Division. Elmer Andrews, again, the first Wage and Hour Administrator and a personal hero, uh, noted in 1939, quote, we began enforcement six months ago with a small headquarters staff and with only 23 inspectors in the field to co cover the whole of this enormous country. In 1939, we have a field force of 131. It is still a skeletal staff inadequate fully to render the service to which employees and employers are both entitled. Now, if we can't take the numbers that Andrew cited, in 1939, with their 131 inspectors, the agency was in charge of 29,442 establishments, which means about 4.5 inspectors for every thousand establishments. And Andrews and his successors struggled with how do you do the work given that imbalance? Well, obviously that resource challenge has not disappeared. Um, the agency is currently ramp ramping up after reductions arising from the failure to replace investigators during the Trump administration to have roughly around 800 investigators currently. But now those 800 investigators are in charge of about 11 million workplace establishment. So that's about 0.07 investigators for every thousand establishments which means the wage and hour division of 1939 had about 60 times greater a ratio of investigators to workplaces than the present agency today. And that means the act's aims can only be accomplished through strategic and proactive application of its resources 
to enforcement, outreach, and education, and from ultimately increased funding and resources from the budget. Now, we changed the approach from a complaint-driven to a more pro proactive approach during the Obama administration. And the current wage and hour division is building on those models. But the ratios and even more the growing complexity of work means the bar for effective enforcement and the need for serious increases in resources keeps going higher. In particular, to achieve its ends, the agency must be ever more directed towards focusing on where problems are most severe, increasing its deterrent impacts, and seeing that everything it does in enforcement, in education, and outreach create maximum ripple effects. That is a must. But it also can only work if responsible employers comply with it, or as one of our panelists who are here from today, exceed its baseline standards. But it fails if employers flout it, directly harming workers and undermining employers who are doing the right thing. I know from my firsthand experience being honored to lead the wage and hour division during the Obama administration of the pernicious impacts arising when firms in an industry find new ways to evade the act. Those practices spread quickly like weeds and lead to the erosion of standards for workers across a geographic area, an occupation, or even an industry. Implementation of the act also rests fundamentally on the presence of partners beyond the, comp compl the, the compliance of employers. It requires the community of unions, worker advocates, state and local agencies, as well as progressive employers to move the needle and build on the foundations created by the law. And we're going to hear a lot more about this from the wonderful panelists today. Let me say just a couple words about political economy and then wrap up. Now, it's always been the case that powerful interests seek to weaken workplace protections. Their ability to do so ebbs and flows, but that has been a constant. I must say I was bemused, if that's the right term, when one of the senators who opposed my nomination noted that some employers in the state opposed my nomination presumably because the law, the law requires them to do something they do not wish to do on their own. Look, that source of opposition to workplace laws was present in 1939. It remains present today, and it will always be present. It is suggestive of the imbalance of power that is the reason for the Fair Labor Standards Act in the first place. But beyond that normal tension of the political economy, we are at a perilous moment, in my view, in terms of workplace protections. That kind of political dominance has been enabled by Citizen United, where the capacity of dark money to, in, to change legislation is at an all-time high. And it's certainly indicative of the amount of money that flowed to oppose my name, nomination from the day it was announced. But that is only one of many signs about how powerful interests are undermining worker protections today through the political process in unprecedented ways. Look at the success of a few large platform companies to reshape public policies in ways they see fit in California with Prop 22, as well as in many other states, including currently my own state of Massachusetts where those companies have sought to exclude themselves from workplace laws. These actions are not only detrimental to working people, but corrosive to democracy itself. So let me say a final word about pulling together the themes of what I've just say, said, uh, and why this is such a critical moment for improving labor standards and fair labor standards. As the economy recovers from the pandemic, workers who have for too long been disadvantaged have for the first time in decades more leverage in the labor market. Low wage workers have outside alternatives in the labor market that allow them to push for higher wages and better conditions. The movement of workers in the labor market, like the recent successes of union organizing, are signs of pushing back against decades of erosion. But left to its own, this trend won't last labor markets will adjust. 
And while some employers will hopefully adjust their policies to continue to improve conditions for their workforce, we're already seeing stories in the press about efforts to curb this restiveness. See, for example, the story earlier this week about a leaked memo by a senior executive, executive at Applebee's touting the rise in the price of gas as dampening the ability of its workforce to have sufficient earnings to demand better pay. This moment represents an important opportunity to seal in better and sustainable norms through the full and fair enforcement of the FSA. By doing so alongside increasing the minimum wage at the federal level, as states have already done so across the nation, we can achieve the time-honored phrase, a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. And we can see that the gains from a growing economy are shared with the working people who make it possible. Thank you so much for allowing me to join you today. Thank you so much, David. That was terrific. I think that sets a perfect foundation for the conversation that we're about to have. So I will just very quickly introduce today's panel. We have a terrific panel with us today. Um, there's more details about them on our website, so I won't uh, go into their bios, but just briefly, uh, today we have Rebecca Dixon, Executive Director of the National Employment Law Project, Michael Lestoria, uh, co-founder and CEO of Ann Pizza, Teresa Romero, president of United Farm Workers, Ben Zipperer, economist at the Economic Policy Institute. And we're delighted to have Noam Scheiber of the New York Times moderating today. Noam covers workers and workplace issues at the Times. Before coming to the Times, he spent nearly 15 years at New Republic Magazine, where he covered economic policy and three presidential campaigns. And he is author of the book, The Escape Artists, the Escape Artists, which is the narrative of the Obama administration's efforts to save the economy from the Great Recession. So he's, uh, I'm sure many of you have enjoyed his reporting in the Times, and we're delighted to have him to uh, moderate this conversation today. So Noam, let me turn it over to you. Um, great, thanks, Maureen. Um, I'm I'm really delighted to be here. I'm a huge fan of the other people on this panel, um, some of whom I've I've uh, been in touch with over the years and have really helped um, you know expand my understanding of of these issues and inform my reporting. So thank thank you all for being here. Um, I just want to briefly pivot off of um, what David said. Um, you know, he's someone I've I've learned quite a bit from over the years, both directly from conversations and from, from reading his book, The Fissured, Works, uh, the Fissured Workplace. Um, the, the one thing that I wanted to seize on from his remarks, which comes up in my work all the time, is um, this question of flexibility. Um, David alluded to um, gig work and gig, gig platforms. And I think, um, you know, uh, the FLSA looms over a ton uh, of what's going on in the workplace at this at this moment, but probably maybe none more than um, than gig work and um, and its various manifestations. Um, and I, I just can't tell you the number of times where I've spoken to an employer and um, whether they're being willful willfully misleading or whether they just don't understand the FLSA, they insist that classifying workers as employees will destroy the flexibility um, that workers and employers really crave. Um, and so they have to stick with a contractor model um, uh, because, you know, otherwise there's no way to get at that flexible relationship. And if we just set aside for the moment the fact that it's not actually up to the employer whether to classify a worker as a contractor or an employee, that has to do with the actual real world circumstances of their relationship with their employee. Um, you know, the, this idea that the FLSA is something that destroys flexibility, I think, is one of the biggest misnomers in, you know, in the economy, in the in the labor market. Um, we have tons of examples of flexible work relationships with employees. You know, we have part time employees. We have seasonal employees. We have employees who work from home. We have employees who work partly from home and partly from an office. We have employees who work full time, but at odd hours, um, there's almost no limit to the amount of flexibility that you can introduce into the employment relationship when you have employees. Um, and this just comes up time and again, uh, as David alluded to, it came up a lot um, in the fight around AB5 and Prop 22 in California. Um, the gig companies, again, insisted over and over that flexibility was uh, was going to be endangered, imperiled. Um, there would be no way to 
salvage the flexible relationships that drivers have to the platforms. And I just re recall having these enormously strange conversations where I would go almost in circles uh, with uh, people from Uber and Lyft. And I would say, you know, well, can you point to me like where in the FLSA does it say that uh, classifying drivers as employees would destroy uh, the flexibility? And, you know, and, and they couldn't because it's not in there. And when we finally, after we sort of got done going back and forth, what, you know, where we sort of landed was um, there's nothing in the law that that prevents this, but they have concerns that um, that if they classify drivers as employees and they create you know these minimum standards or, or they abide by minimum standards then you're going to have some driver somewhere who decides he or she is going to go drive at you know three in the morning um in the middle of a suburb where there are no customers around and just hang out in their car and earn 15 dollars or 20 dollars an hour um to do no work and because they'll have to pay uh, minimum wage um I think that's, um, you know, uh, for reasons I can elaborate on, a uh, highly unlikely scenario. And even if it uh, were something that they would have to restrict, um, there's nothing in the FLSA that um, that requires them uh, to not allow that. But it, it just, I think, um, pointed to what can be very bizarre in these conversations is that there ends up being this huge uproar around flexibility. And when you peel back, um, you know, the different um, leaves of the artichoke, you realize that, um, if there is even a kernel of truth, it's these like extremely remote, extremely obscure uh, hypothetical scenarios that actually have nothing to do with the law, but their own assessment of supply and demand. So um, all of which is to say that I think, um, you know, the work that David has done and that some of the folks at, at NELP uh, and EPI and, and some of the unions um, and just, you know, a lot of economists um, have done to sort of clarify um, what the FLSA requires and what it doesn't and what it would preclude and what it wouldn't is extremely valuable. And, uh, and that's why I think um, a panel like this is so important. Um, so let me, let me get right to it. Um, I'll, I'll start with Rebecca. Um, as someone who advocates for workers, often very vulnerable workers, workers who face um, all manner of exploitation in the workplace, um, what, what tools does this law um, give you? What kind of power does it give you and, and people who do what you do to redress um, the issues that arise in the workplace for these workers? So I, I think it's really important to, to build on what David said. Um, you know, we tend to think that the labor market and the economy in this country, we tend to think equal opportunity when we see that, but that's actually not the case. Opportunity is quite segregated in this country. And our labor law is really key in enshrining that and perpetuating that segregation. So for example, 40% of our jobs in this economy pay poverty level wages, but the burden of these bad jobs is uneven. It falls most heavily on women and workers of color. And we know that discrimination accounts for 38% of the gender wage gap. And for black women, that's even worse because they're in a double bind situation. We know that the blacker an occupation is or becomes, the lower the wages. And the more female dominated an occupation is, the more undervalued that work is, especially when we're talking about care work, which we've seen uh, a lot in this pandemic. And consequently, um, you know, what I'm describing, this is called occupational segregation. And it means that persistently across time, so from, you know, the New Deal time and before that, uh, women and people of color are shunted into low paying, precarious and often unsafe work. And they end up there staying there for years, sometimes a lifetime. Um, so with the Fair Labor Standards Act, you know, what we would like to see is being able to have people not stuck in these bad jobs across a lifetime. Um, we know that um, essentially once you're stuck there, it's really hard to get out. And so for us, really trying to make it clear what the Fair Labor Standards Act, what the strengths were and what the weaknesses are. And so the strengths, of course, um, we know like foundational setting a wage floor for millions of workers, but a substantial weakness was leaving out large portions of workers. And, you know, to talk about scale, we're talking about half of Black men, half of Mexican-American men, Native American men and women, and significant numbers of Asian American workers. And like, here's really where the political gets personal because 90% of Black women were left out of the Fair Labor Standards Act when it was created because they worked in farm and domestic work. 
And for me, I grew up in rural Southwest Mississippi. And so my great grandmother was a sharecropper and my grandmother worked as a domestic and they were a part of these 90% of women. And so for me, policy has real impacts and I deeply understand what's at stake in this work and the work that I do to make sure that race and gender don't determine your fate. And so we are really trying to work to support workers who are fighting to expand their rights um, in, in this moment of great realignment, resignation, whatever you want to call it. But workers are standing up. Um, they are demanding their rights. And we are, are right there with them uh, to support. Thank, thank you for that. Um, Teresa, let me let me go to you. Um, can you um, just tell us, I think a lot of people, um, you know, know, um, know the United Farm Workers from, you know, some of the iconic um, organizing battles of decades past and Cesar Chavez and, you know, some of the heroes of the labor movement. Can you tell us about the workers that you represent today um, across what industries, the range of jobs they do and, and just the biggest issues they face on the job today? Sure, of course. Uh, first, thank you for having me here today. Uh, this is a very important conversation. Uh, this year, we, uh, the United Farm Workers is celebrating uh, our 60th anniversary. Six decades of representing workers and in in working, not only in organizing, but legislative uh, bills to improve their working conditions. Uh, currently, we represent workers in the vegetable industry, mushrooms, uh, berries, uh, uh, apples. I mean, it is a, 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 a variety of, of fruits and vegetables uh, workers that we represent. Uh, unfortunately, because workers were excluded from FLSA, um, the, the work that we need to do to improve their working conditions is slow. I'm going to tell you that this is the first year that farm workers in California are, are earning overtime pay after eight hours of work or 40 hours a week. And other states don't do it. We were able to get a, a bill passed also in Washington State and Oregon uh, to give for workers uh, uh, overtime pay. In California, we have uh, heat illness protections for farm workers that actually are is saving lives, as you probably as we all know. Last year, the temperatures here in the uh, West Coast were incredibly high. Farm workers were working under 120 degrees. Uh, and because we have now those, those protections, uh, lives are being saved. And it's basic protections, allowing farm workers to have fresh water, having a shaded area for, for farm workers to rest or to have their, their meal periods. Um, educating workers of what uh, heat illness symptoms are so they can recognize them. Most of us don't recognize them and have a paid 10 minute break every two hours when the temperatures are 95 degrees of, or, or over. These are just basic things that any other industry would have, but it takes us uh, decades to be able to get these protections. Um, we uh, were able to uh, work uh, with uh, growers organizations and uh, members of Congress from both uh, um, sides of the aisle and passed the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, which would have given farm workers the opportunity to get a path to legalization. Uh, we know that we need 10, uh, uh, 60 senators to support this bill, and unfortunately, we have not been able to get 10 senators to support it. This bill, of course, is important not only for the, the farm workers and their families, but also to have a stable workforce in agriculture. Uh, the great majority of people who work in, with, in agriculture right now are immigrants. The great majority are undocumented. And without this workforce, uh, the agricultural industry in this country would be would probably disappear. Uh, we know that not all, and not, not all of us can perform this work. We actually sent an invitation to all 100 uh, senators to work one day in the fields so they have an idea of, you know, what it takes to do the work. We received only a response from two senators that agreed to it, uh, was Senator Padilla and Senator Booker. So we're going to be working with them so they can experience firsthand what it is uh, that it takes to be a farm worker. Just one day. <laughs>
That that seems like a fair ask. Um, um, ben, um, let me let me turn to you for a moment. Um, uh, ben uh, is someone who, um, in in the first few years that I did this job, was incredibly helpful in in just helping me um, kind of survey the landscape of research that was available. I read, you know, his own work and the work of uh, his collaborators. Um, ben, can you just describe um, the kind of consensus on uh, among economists on the effects of the minimum wage on employment? And particularly as you know, we've experimented with raising the minimum wage uh, in some cases by very significant amounts in states and localities around the country, um, how that consensus has evolved and what economists have learned about how high it can go but without significant employment effects. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think minimum wages have always been, you know, um, a very, uh, um, well-studied topic in, in economics, and um, that's because there it's political importance, but also because it, you know, teaches economists and us the like lessons about how labor markets actually work, and provide us with information about you know what you were talking about earlier about how you can actually have an economy um, that allows a lot of flexibility, but still has mandates or policies that improve working conditions. So if you looked back about 40 or 50 years ago, I think it would be fair to say that many economists and also basically liberal economic opinion generally of the mindset that um, minimum wages do more harm than good. The story went that is if, you know, if you raise the minimum wage, you were going to make the cost of labor more expensive, employers would hire fewer workers, and ultimately you're going to end up hurting the low wage workers that you're trying to help. And, you know, even as in the 1980s, uh, the New York Times editorial board was saying that the right minimum wage is zero dollars an hour. And, you know, at the same time, you saw a huge slowdown in the frequency and the size of federal minimum wage increases. And, um, you know, before then, minimum wage increases were relatively frequent, mostly tracked the growth of labor productivity in the economy until about the 1970s and 80s, um, until the business community and political leaders really turned against the minimum wage increases and um, using the support of economic research at the time. Now, in the 1990s and 2000s, economic research on the minimum wage really started to change. There was more data available, and economists generally became more careful and more transparent in how they conducted economic analysis. And today, if you were to look at a, you know, an apples-to-apples -apples comparison of studies published in the last couple of decades or so, they show that the you know, the typical or the middle of the road employment effect of the minimum wage is actually very small and nothing like the scare stories that critics of the minimum wages often talk about. Minimum wages tend to raise wages, but without much job loss. And the fact that the minimum wage increases can lead and have led to little or no job loss um, has very profound implications for what is possible with good economic policy. Just on minimum wages, you know, we've seen much higher minimum wages uh, in recent years um, with larger increases. And they have, you know, in my view, according to the best research, led to very little job loss. Um, and so that, you know, means that we have a lot of room uh, um, to raise minimum wages even higher. But also, you know, minimum wage research and economic research it really uh, has now demonstrated that employers have a lot of power in the labor market and they have latitude to set wages. And unrestricted, they will tend to underprovide decent working conditions. And so what that means is that there is a, a scope for countervailing institutions to improve working conditions without a lot of negative consequences, like minimum wages, but also paid leave mandates or you know, making it easier for workers to bargain collectively. Thank, um, thank you. Um, so, uh, Michael, let me turn to you. Um, you're someone who lives this reality on from the perspective of an employer. Um, uh, you said that you pay uh, typically sixteen hour, uh, sorry, sixteen dollar an hour minimum wage at, at at your restaurants. Obviously, it, it varies a bit by market and, and geography. Um, how how has that um, how has that worked for you as a practical matter as an employer? How has that affected your bottom line? How has that affected your um, the labor that you're able to attract? Um, what have you seen um, in terms of kind of turnover, productivity? How does it all add up, um, you know, in your in your balance sheet, in your business balance sheet? 
Yeah, of course. First off, I'm never sure I'm going to get entirely used to staring at myself while I'm speaking. I miss actual audiences of people and faces so you know who you're talking to. Um, but yeah, I mean, my, my approach to advocacy has been you know, a little bit different. You know, I set out on this journey about a decade ago, and the whole notion behind and pizza was the and. The and came before the pizza, and the and for us was always about promoting unity and uniting the working class around fair wages and really trying to help the food service industry more broadly speaking and the restaurant industry as a subsector to start shifting and shaping the conversation towards we've got to do a much better job of taking care of our workforce making sure they feel appreciated engaged and supported just quick background on Ann Pizza, if you are unfamiliar, you know, we have 65 company locations, company owned and operated, multi-state operator from Boston down to Virginia. We're going to be opening another 35 locations this year. And that's important only because my answer to the question around what are we doing with respect to wages and democratizing decision making in our organization, the answer is we're doing a lot and that, that that a lot is contributing to the outsized growth and impact we will be one of the fastest growing restaurant chains with some of the highest margins but it all starts with our focus really being on providing quality jobs we really apply the good jobs thesis to the organization and for us higher wages is the single clearest way to say to our workforce we value you and that really is important to us and to our brand that really is the symbol that's about uniting the working class. And we kind of live by this notion of all of our work counts for nothing if our people cannot live on the wages we pay them. Currently, we are right around a starting minimum wage of about $18 an hour that's shifted upwards. And we've been making a really, really big push to try to get that closer and closer to $20 an hour, I think for obvious reasons. But something that gets lost in the conversation about wages in particular, it's, it's actually good business. Higher wages for us has led to greater consumer spending, greater workforce productivity, things every company benefits from. And there's been a lot of chatter around the notion of a labor shortage. And I think the frustration from where I sit is that really ignores the realities of the food service industry. I can tell you that millions of restaurant workers were fired or furloughed during the pandemic. Those who weren't were often forced to put their health at risk by potentially exposing themselves to COVID-19 at work or were subjected to abuse by customers when they tried to enforce their company's uh, uh, COVID protocols. Like the pandemic has highlighted like systemic issues that have been problems in restaurant and food service for decades, low wages, lack of benefits, dangerous working conditions, the cyclical nature of, of, of literally laying off and rehiring staff when it's only convenient for the employer's balance sheet. And so like these aren't new problems. Like these have been around for a long time, but we do need new solutions. And so the, the body of work that we've really been focused on or how do we create a case study that we can take to much larger businesses? How do we ourselves grow to a place where we'll be taken serious around there is a better way to do it. There's a way to treat people with dignity and respect and to have really strong margins, lower turnover, and quite frankly, above and beyond all, a workforce that is shows up and cares about the work that they're doing. And if you can convince people that are working largely part-time and hourly to care about your company, to care about your business, gosh, that shows up. We have some of the best GX scores, as I mentioned before, you know, one of the top performing from a revenue perspective, like pizza chains in the US with the highest margins next to Domino's. But Domino's is a largely franchise system. So when they report, they're reporting a, a subsect of their company owned that they're cherry picking and holding on for themselves. So I would argue probably one of the highest margin, if not the highest margin uh, restaurant chain out there, one of the fastest growing. And, and it's all because of us approaching things with what's the right thing to do leading with that and letting the data and results when you treat people the right way show for itself. So d just to stick with you for a sec, I think your experience is validated through some of the research that we've seen about high road models versus low road models. Um, you know, Zainab Tan at MIT has done great work on this showing that, you know, 
you pay higher wages, you get more productivity, you get lower turnover, you save on training, customers like, you know, like the experience a lot better. We've seen it, you know, in case studies of like um, Costco versus Walmart, um, you know, Trader Joe's, all the um, a variety of, of employers that do this. But, you know, you know better than I do, they, they are the minority. <laughs> um, why, why do you think that, you know, when you present other employers with this evidence, they still, for whatever reason, don't seem to buy it, you know, or, you know, they, um, you, you can show them studies, you can show them, you know, uh, rivals that are um, pursuing this high road model, and you can show that it, you know, has, you know, either a neutral or a positive effect on the bottom line. And yet, you know, we don't see it, we don't see it taken off. What, what What's the deal? What, where is the, the disconnect coming? Yeah, I think, look, it's, it starts with a legacy mindset that has now become dated and quite frankly, more irrelevant every single day that passes, right? There's very little diversity in leadership at the executive ranks. Boards look almost identical. You could copy and paste, you know, one company's board and it looks identical to a brother or sister companies. And so there hasn't really been a lot of diversity in thought. And I, I think oftentimes in the public markets, the way that the incentives are for short-term performance over long-term sustainability. Some of the best food service brands, to be candid, have been doing this, you know, with arguably questionable politics in other directions, but you can look to the in and outs and the Chick-fil-A's of the world. And, and to some extent, at one point, you know, prior to the last decade, Starbucks was probably further distanced with progressive workforce policy. These companies have outperformed virtually every other brand that's focused on like reducing or stifling pay and benefits for their workforces. So there's plenty of examples. It just takes longer and it's the road less traveled. Now, what I will say about that is like, this doesn't really matter as much as it used to matter, right? And I talk often about like the irony is that minimum wages don't matter if you can't get workers to show up. Minimum wages aren't mandated wages and $15 an hour is the floor. Like my phone has been ringing more in the last three to six months from executives actually wanting to have a conversation when before they weren't interested because their way simply isn't working, right? This isn't a great resignation or a labor short. This is a labor revolution. Wages are rising, unemployment is falling, workers for the, for, for the first time in a long time are using their power to demand better. And, and part of that, and we talk about like the market catching up to unsustainable businesses that for decades relied on suppressed wages for profit. Like this, th this is, I think, one of the largest like wave of minimum wages, like minimum wage raises in the history of the country. And, and I love the fact that like a lot of this like organization is happening online. Like go to the Reddit anti work like channel and you can see like growing by the tens of thousands a week of people that now in partnership with unions that provide a tremendous amount of structure are giving them the confidence to speak up and speak out and know that there's a different way to do this. I mean, we have 81 states and cities that are raising minimum wages this year. 44 cities are increasing minimum wages above $15 an hour. Once considered crazy when I was, you know, beating the drum on this 10 years ago, $15 an hour is now becoming the reality for over half of the country. And I just think that's important to like lock in on and identify. I mean, we were the first restaurant chain to go to $15 an hour. And like I said, wouldn't change it. And if anything, would have done it earlier. So a lot of it has to do with an old, pro an old approach that's fastly becoming outdated. And I, I do believe that this revolution is going nowhere and businesses are going to be forced to, if you want your restaurants or if you want your you know, manufacturing to be staffed, you have to be approaching this differently. And that's a really good thing. So um, Ben, I, I just want to circle back to you. Um, I think one of the most controversial corners of this debate is whether there's a kind of upper limit. Um, you know, I think the, as you said, the consensus now is we have a lot of room to maneuver. We can um, raise minimum wage uh, statutorily by quite a bit over, certainly over the federal minimum wage, but even, you know, as Michael was saying, you know, 15 and up. Um, but, the, you know, at some point there arises this question, like how far is too far? How far can we go? 
um, obviously, as you know, inflation concerns uh, proliferate, this this becomes uh, a part of the conversation too. Um, wh what have you learned? You know, I, I remember having a conversation with you years ago about um, you know drawing some insights from the FLSA in the early days when you know, as a practical matter, um, the ratio of the federal minimum wage to the local median wage in you know a place like you know some place in the deep south or a very rural place would mean that it was very very high you know 60 70 percent of the median wage 80 percent what, what have we learned either from historical studies that that look that it kind of exploit that um, relationship or from foreign countries um, other examples where the ratio of the minimum wage to the prevail you know the typical wage or media, median wage was very very high yeah, so I think that one of the most striking historical experiences we had was, um, you know, what uh, David Weil talked about earlier in the late 1960s in the in the United States. So, you know, as he mentioned, the um, the original FLSA didn't actually cover, a, you know, large portions of the economy. And Rebecca Dixon mentioned this earlier. Um, you know, basically, as a part of a political um, compromise. Um, uh, uh, several industries that primarily black workers worked in were excluded from, you know, in this case, minimum wage protection, but the FLSA generally. Um, and so, uh, you know, in contrast to some of what seems to be happening today, where we're actually kind of like carving, seem to be carving out exceptions in labor laws for like gig workers, back then there were expansions in the FLSA to actually cover the large portions of uh, those those excluded portions of the workforce, like for example, um, laundries, hospitals, uh, nursing homes. You know, even the retail sector, restaurants were not covered by the FLSA or, or under minimum wage uh, regulation until the late 1960s. And um, what we know from economic research on that is that. Um, those were extremely large increases in the minimum wage, larger than we have uh, mostly experienced uh, since then. And they raised wages with very little um, overall effect on the number of uh, low wage workers working. And in fact, they had, you know, it, it caused extremely large changes in black workers wage, like uh, David Weil uh, mentioned, that um, basically um, uh, helped um, uh, reduce the black to white earnings uh, gap at the time. Um, you know, that's in contrast to like what we're seeing, um, you know, today where we have gig worker companies um, that are basically arguing that um, they're not subject to minimum wage protection or anti-discrimination protection, workers' compensation, unemployment benefit. And so I think it's important to, you know, recognize that we have historical precedent for very large increases in minimum wages uh, or, you know, expanding workplace uh, protections generally. And they have uh, mostly benefited workers with very, um, you know, little downside. Other countries have you know, recognize that they also have, um, you know, a lot of scope to raise uh, wages, minimum wages much higher. So for example, the UK is raising its, you know, will by 2024 in just a couple of years, raise its minimum wage to essentially the equivalent of like a $15 minimum wage in the United States. So they're raising their minimum wage to two thirds of the, the median wage. Um, and um, that's because, you know, they have, um, that's because partly because of the economic research supporting that, and also that they have, you know, what's called a low pay commission that actually studies low pay in the, in the UK and makes recommendations to raise the minimum wage to an appropriate target um, uh, that, that can reduce poverty and, and, and reduce inequality. Cool. Um, Rebecca, I want to go back to you. Um, a few of the panelists have alluded to um, workers leverage and the great resignation and just, you know, the tightening of the labor market that normally um, gives workers more power. Um, you know, I think that theory would be that as workers get more leverage, things like misclassification and wage theft should recede. Um, are, are we actually seeing that as, you know, as workers get more power, or at least as we read about workers getting more power, are we seeing fewer abuses or not really? I, I think the, the answer is not really. So we've seen a lot in this, in this economic time of 
like increased wages, which is wonderful and great. And we've also seen that being kind of eaten up by inflation in some places, right? But what we haven't seen is employers saying, okay, we're going to give you paid time off. We're going to give you uh, a predictable schedule from week to week or predictable hours from week to week. So we're seeing a lot with wages, but not a ton with other things because a lot of this, and I think one of the other panelists touched on this, the government needs to create the floor for what happens. And in the case of gig workers, we haven't done that. And I think we, we often see the perspective of this being like a new thing and the 21st century work. But the truth is that this, this type of precarious and contingent work is nothing new. So we hear about independent contracting in uh, the gig economy, but it's actually prevalent in lots of different sectors of the economy. So you don't hear about the issue with businesses that treat workers like independent contractors in things like home care, janitorial, construction, um, personal services. So really sort of this gig company thing is dressing it up with technology, but it's a decades old problem that's been happening. And sort of like thinking about the scope, we're talking about around 23 million workers. And of course, you know, I mean, I say this a lot, but it is not even, it's uneven, right? And so we do see workers of color being the ones who don't have the bargaining power because they don't have the options in the labor market to actually turn down these jobs, right? Like people don't take these jobs because they have other options. And so if you're a person who your options are to work in the service sector or to work in retail and the hours that you get are unpredictable, you're trying to create some flexibility and predictability for yourself by driving for a company because you can decide when those hours are, right? But it's not, they're both bad jobs and you're taking the best of a bad option. And that's because you don't have power in the labor market, which is deeply rooted in race and gender discrimination and our history of structural racism in this country. Um, Teresa, um, I, I wanted to, just follow up on where you left off in your last comments about the exclusions to the FLSA and how that's being redressed. Obviously, as you said, um, we've seen some encouraging signs in California and Washington and a few other states that have started capping the work week and mandating overtime for farm workers. Um, I guess the question I wanted to ask is how much of this is about the law um, and gaps in the law and how much of it is just even when we have laws on the books, employers just flout it? Um, you know, I think some of the most egregious examples you guys have certainly dealt with. I know in in reporting on work that the like the coalition of Immokalee workers has done in Florida and parts of the South, we see this there too, where you know you just get these horrific, egregious stories of assault um, in in fields, in um, you know even wage slavery, essentially. None of that is legal, <laughs> and yet we see it happen. So, how much of this is is actually about the law, and how much of it is just you know scrutinizing employers, even if the laws exist? Sorry, you know, thank you for that question, Norm. This is very important. In the farm worker movement, we like to say the laws in the books are not the laws in the fields. Um, these, there are laws that exist to protect workers, but there, there is no way to enforce them. The only way we have been able to enforce these laws is uh, through a, a union contract. Um, we have, and we're working right now with the administration on protecting not only domestic workers. If you think about it, domestic workers, the majority of them work seasonal work. And many, in many cases, um, their children have to work with them because they don't make enough money to support the family. If they work five to six months out of the year, there is not enough uh, uh, to support a family. But in addition to that, there are states where um, it is a law that need, laws that need to change because it is legal for 12 year old, 13 year old to work during the week when the school is off season and they, they can work in the fields. That, that, and that happens in Washington state. Uh, in Oregon, according to the Oregon state law, the minimum age at which a minor uh, may work in agriculture then school hours is 16 years old. This is a work that is very difficult, that is very demanding, that is very 
physically uh, demanding and, and a child should not be doing that. So we need to do both. We need to be able to enforce the laws and we'd be able to change the laws. When you have a lawsuit uh, with H-2A workers, which are the guest workers that come to the United States during a season, we have right now, there is a lawsuit in, in Georgia with an employer that has applied for up to 70,000 uh, H-2A workers during several years is being now sued by the state because of women being raped, workers died, um, workers not being paid, enslaved. These are things that should not happen in our country. These are things that we should not allow to happen. And if we're, we're bringing these workers, we should make sure that they are safe, that they're getting paid what they are offered. When, and this program, unfortunately, uh, has the workers under the employer um, control 20, 100%. They live in, in employer housing. They are transported to work by the employer. They, in many cases, uh, although it is illegal, workers paid up to eight ten thousand dollars $10,000 to recruit is to, to uh, process their visas. It is illegal. But until there is a way to enforce these laws, to protect these laws, to represent these, uh, to pr uh, protect these workers, to represent these workers, nothing is going to be changed. And this is something that just came out. But how many other stories of uh, farm workers that are going through the same conditions, or through the same circumstances, through the same horrible working and living conditions, uh, we don't know anything about. And the only way we're going to do it is if we find a way to implement uh, and, and, and ensure that all the regulations and laws of this country are being respected. And right now it's not happening. And with, with some of these new laws about um, overtime and work week, like in California and Washington State, wh wh um, what are you finding so far? Are employers um, abiding by them or what? How, how, is the, how is that working out so far? Some employers are, and the only ones that I can testify, you know, 100% uh, are employers that are under union contract. What we're hearing from farm workers is that what many employers in, are doing right now is they're paying the workers uh, through payroll for 40 hours. And then they ask them to work overtime, but they pay them in cash and not the overtime rate. So they're still finding a way to do it, uh, to, to, to not pay the workers what they deserve. And unfortunately, because workers need the money, because workers are mostly undocumented, they accept uh, these changes, these, these um, uh, way of, of doing business by the employer because they need the work. They know that if they, they say something, they're going to be uh, threatened with being fired. And because we have many family members that work in the same farm, it is not just one person that might get fired, it is the entire family that might get fired. Uh, um, so um, I'm just going to go um, take, uh, you know, ask one or two more questions of my own, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, um, this is a question, I guess, um, just to go back to Ben on, on some of the innovations that we've seen in cities and states over the past 10 years. Um, of those innovations, like what do you think would be the biggest bang for our buck in, um, incorporating on the federal level besides simply just like increasing the wage floor? Um, you know, I guess one other piece of low hanging fruit would just be adjusting for you know automatic inflation adjustments over time. But are there other sort of innovative elements of um, city and state statutes that you think uh, would really scale nationally? Uh, in terms of the minimum wage, yeah, you know, um, raising the minimum wage to a decent level um, so that the minimum wage is not a poverty wage and then automatically increasing it with inflation or with wage growth so that it doesn't, you know, erode over time. Um, I think, um, I don't know if this is what you're getting at, but I think it's also important to, reason, you know, realize that while raising the minimum wage, you know, I think it will reduce poverty. I think the evidence is very clear on that. Evidence is clear that it raises wages without much job loss. It primarily affects just the bottom of the wage distribution, you know, by definition. So we need other policies to improve, you know, working conditions generally, you know, overtime policies, um, you know, just like Teresa mentioned, they're not well enforced. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of loopholes just within the law, like setting salary thresholds, like way too low, 
um, that make it easy for employers to misclassify or you know avoid paying those um, protections. And then finally, I think what would go, you know, if you're talking about biggest bang for the buck, then what would go a long way is restoring and strengthening the protections for workers to collectively bargain and organize their workplaces. I mean, many workers are misclassified as in independent contractors, preventing them from organizing under current labor law. And even when workers in principle are allowed to organize, they face enormous um, uh, and illegal employer resistance and pressure because the penalties for violating labor laws, as you know, are minuscule. Um, you know, my co-authors and I have found that employers were charged with violating federal labor law in four out of every 10 supervised union elections. And that's because it's very cost effective, unfortunately, because penalties are so low for employers to violate laws like that. So I think, you know, helping workers uh, collectively bargain and organize like through something like the PRO Act, the Protecting the Right to Organize Act, would help to address employer misclassification, increase the, you know, and, uh, by increasing the penalties for employer aggression and do a lot to, you know, increase working uh, worker bargaining power and affect wages throughout the wage distribution. Um, so um, let me just cut back to Rebecca um, one last time here. Um, I do have a few questions from the audience, but um, and some of them are in this vein. Um, just on that same question, Rebecca, um, sort of you alluded to this earlier, but sort of federal legislation that you think would be sort of biggest bang for its buck um, that, you know, you know, uh, that Congress, um, Congress could take over and, and the president could sign. Right. Um, I, I don't know that this is like on the table, but we never did actually go back and include all the workers that we excluded to begin with. And so thinking about how that can be done in a way that is sensitive to what the workers need. Um, but there's options to expand rights and we really should be taking um, taking measures to do that. I think one important thing to mention about the minimum wage, uh, the federal minimum wage, is that even though we are seeing wages increase because of the economic situation right now, we know that um, for Black workers in particular, they the majority of them live in the South, and the Southern states generally don't have a, a state minimum wage. And so the only way those workers are going to get a wage, a, a raise to 15, is if the federal government passes a 15. And so there is really a racial justice element to the the wage floors that the federal level, the Fair Labor Standards Act was supposed to put in place in the first place. So for folks who are included in it and also for folks who are excluded from it. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to ask uh, a few questions from the audience. Some of them um, we've hit on in our in our conversation. I don't know if David is still here, but there was a, qu a good question about enforcement. David, in his remarks, alluded to strategic enforcement. Um, maybe he could say a little more about how that works. And then I guess the other question, um, question from the audience was just, um, how should we think about kind of enforcement through litigation, uh, you, you know, kind of private litigation uh, versus the, getting the federal government involved? So um, strategic enforcement is is really the idea of moving away from complaint driven enforcement activity, which dominated how Wage and Hour did its work for many, many decades and, and how a lot of state agencies acted. And, and the problem with that is workers who sometimes are often the most subjected to the worst conditions um, are the least likely to actually exercise those rights. So a complaint driven mechanism pushes you not towards the places where the biggest problems are. And it also ties up resources that can have much more impact if you think about systemic problems and, and trying to root out the, some of the underlying economic drivers for non-compliance and wage theft by thinking more proactively. What's very exciting is in the Obama administration, we really piloted a lot of these things and kind of built it into the way the agency acts. But a lot of states have really taken this up um, and, and really continue to push for new ways to think about using enforcement. And there's sort of a, I sometimes call it ratcheting federalism that originally the FLSA learned from the states where there had been state level minimum wages and the federal government adopted it. 
Elmer Andrews, who I keep talking about, was actually from New York State first, and, and the feds kind of got ahead of where states were. I think we're at a point now that a lot of states are doing things that the federal government can learn from and leverage um, and, and really build on, on these, these ideas. And as someone who enforced these laws um, during the Obama administration, how did you think about private litigation? I mean, would, would you collaborate with, um, with, you know, private parties bringing litigation? Would you just monitor it closely and kind of see, you know, um, try to be complementary in your enforcement? How did you think about, the, about I, that piece of it? No, that's a great question. I think it's more the latter. It's trying to comp be complementary to it. Uh, it's a very important provision of the FLSA giving workers private rights of action. Again, often the workers who are more likely to use those private rights of action are not the ones who most need that assistance. Um, the, the other thing that we did, I mean, if you're going to tell some people that the, the there's not going to be a complete response to their complaint, the existence of private rights of action was something that we could actually make sure that people could still get, let's say, back wages they were entitled to, where the assessment was they could take those actions individually or through class um, and in ways that that complemented what we were trying to do as, a, as an enforcement agency. And again, I think many states take that same same approach. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, we've gotten um, a, a question or two on um, a sub minimum wage workers, uh, you know, tipped workers are probably the most prominent examples. There's been a lot of of energy in the past several years around removing the sub minimum and and just making everyone subject to the same the same wage floor. Um, Michael, as someone you know who probably has workers who who get tips, like how do you think about tipping? How do you think about you know where the tip fits into the workers' take home pay? Do you do anything like you know tip pooling? Just in general, as this conversation on tips have evolved, how have you gone about it? Yeah, we, we actually are, are not in a tipped business, right? So we kind of fall more into the fast food side of the restaurant sector. That being said, I'm a huge fan of the one fair wage movement. And, and that's probably a much like, meatier conversation than, than likely what we have for today, given it, it, there's a lot to talk about, a lot to dig into. I think a lot that Rebecca probably could share as well, given all the work that she's done. But it, it, the, the bottom line is that there shouldn't be a sub minimum. You know, everyone should be working off of a minimum wage. Minimum wages need to increase right, across the board in this country. Um, you know, we've seen it. Even the difference between Washington D.C. and Virginia, minimum wage, and the and the, and the way people are treated in, in Virginia. And so it, it's a bit. It's practically absurd, quite frankly, how long it's been. And and we need to address things far beyond you know the minimum wage. There needs to be a set of rules. And I think to the question you even asked earlier to, to Ben around like is there a, a ceiling with respect to wages? The reality is, people are smart. They will figure it out. Like I'm always a big believer that you know entrepreneurs or executives, if you make something cost more, they're not going to stop doing the job or doing the work, right? Or building out their companies. They have an opportunity to earn. It's what they do. If all of a sudden you tell me, Michael, your business is going to cost 30% more to run and operate, I'm not going to run away, fold up my tent, right, and, and go hide in the corner. I'm going to figure out how to absorb that 30%, look for efficiencies, make some profit elsewhere, or just deal with the fact that 10% is the new 20% or 20% is the new 30%. Like people are always going to be creative. And we have to lean on the fact that as a country, if we're lifting up the lowest wage workers, if we're taking care of them, any policy that does that is good policy. Everything else will be figured out along the way. Let me just um, bring in Rebecca here one last time uh, for the last question. Rebecca, I don't know if you have thoughts on, on the sub minimum or if you wanted to hit on something else, but um, please um, feel free to weigh in one last time. Sure. I wanted to circle back to the strategic enforcement. So one of the important things to be aware of is that in uh, a lot of these low wage jobs, workers have to sign uh, an arbitration agreement to take the job, which means they are signing away their right to private action around these issues. So that takes private right of action off the table, which means, and they also are prevented by signing these coercive waivers, also can't do a class action lawsuit. And so it means that the 
enforcement from the, the federal and state agencies is the only game in town for some of them. And so it's very crucial that those resources are able to, um, to have the, the biggest impact. And so there is this, um, this project in California that we are a, a central hub, a, a part of it, where 18 community-based organizations partner with the labor commissioner's office and they're looking at specific industries where there are high violations of wage theft. And they've been able to recover so much money for workers in this. And also as part of this, uh, the community-based organizations have been transforming the culture for workers around speaking up and, and using their power. So that's just one example of like really using the community involvement to increase uh, the effectiveness of enforcement. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you all um, for a, a great discussion. And thanks for the questions from the audience. I'll just um, I'll throw it over to Maureen at this point. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, David, Noam, Rebecca, Michael, Teresa, and Ben. That was just a fantastic conversation. Clearly, we could have gone on longer. You guys have a tremendous amount of knowledge and, and information to share. So. Um, uh, really appreciate all of that. Thanks very much to our audience for, for joining us, for your questions and comments. Um, please do take a moment to respond to our feedback survey if you haven't already done so before you leave. Um, it's in the poll tab in the slider box on the right side of your screen. Um, you can also send us an email at eop.program at aspeninstitute.org. We'd love to hear from you. Um, I want to take a moment to say many thanks to my behind the scenes colleagues who uh, make all these events work. It's definitely a team effort. So many thanks to Matt Helmer, Tony Mastria, Adrian Lee, Victoria Prince, and Yori Chang. Really appreciate all your efforts. Um, just another reminder to uh, join us April 19th for The Future We Need, Organizing for a Better Democracy in the 21st Century. Um, and again, on April 27th for Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, Fulfilling the Promise of Equal Opportunity. I think all of these conversations, we can see how the different laws and, um, and these issues of uh, principles of de democracy are all interrelated. So um, please join us for those, those conversations. Um, and we hope to see you then. Thanks, everybody.